in the old Roman days, one of the one of uh, writer and philosopher of, of Roman times, Cicero, said that in war the law falls silent. That's not the case. In war, human rights still apply. A law from conflict does apply, and the the the, the problem, however, is that yes, these viola- violations occur, and very few people are brought before tribunals. And that's is really the the question. But also these rules, there are many of these rules, and, and I think that we, we, without being contentious, because I think it's quite well recorded by accounts from the Red Cross governments, the reality is that both in Ukraine and in uh, Gaza, there have been most likely war crimes committed. When I talk about war crimes, we're talking about th- that military commanders have to decide when you have a target close to a hospital or close to a school, what is the best way of achieving the military objective? Sometimes it might well be, well, you'll have to wait. Sometimes you might have to take a decision. It's not a a, a completely proportional analysis, but yes, what kind kind of weapons are you going to use? Are you going to, to, if you have a what you believe is the military base or a compound of the enemy forces, which are within 30 meters from a school where five days a week you've got young people, young young children there. How do you attain your military objective? You're entitled to complete your military objective, but it's you don't have a free hand on doing what you want. And I think that, and, and so maybe at some point, yes, you want to limit your, losses, but sending a bomber with a, a, a huge bomb or missile that is going to create incredible loss of wa- life, casualties, destruction, well, then you should think twice. So military commanders have an obligation. They are well advised in general by legal advisors and other advisors, and they take that decision on the basis of the information they have. So that's what that. So in the case of Gaza or Ukraine, it is possible that sometimes some bombings that create casualties might have been based on the fact that the information available at the time meant that the this the measure taken might have been proportional, might have been the the what would have limited the casualties, but then. On the ground, it's all based on how much information and verifiable information you have. What is also another possible viola- discussion has been about uh, violations of law farm conflict. Uh, there was a few months ago a dam in eastern Ukraine that was bombed <coughs> by Russian forces, and that created environmental catastrophe, flooding uh, in, in, in some in some places in eastern Ukraine. And there were a few commentators who said that this was a war crime. Again, again, we have to be careful. In the case of uh, of that dam, it, it it is possible that it was a war crime, but dams are not protected. Are not immune from attacks. The, what the additional protocol one of the Geneva Convention says is that there it's they shouldn't. Uh, nuclear plants, the dams, dikes should not be targeted unless there is an imperative necessity to do so. So there's a margin of maneuver. I think the problem really sometimes when we look at it as members of the public, there are losses of life, of infrastructure that make no sense, but we have still to look at it through the lenses of of uh, uh, the law firm conflict. It's like claims of uh, genocide. That's again, first of all, claim, genocide, it's very high threshold to say that someone had the intent to destroy a whole uh, part or a whole group. Uh, and it, it is, it, and I think that many listeners will, uh, I mean, totally, truly and genuinely believe uh, a genocide is taking has taken place or is taking place in either in Gaza or in eastern Ukraine, but we have to look at it through the lenses of the law uh, to avoid also that the, the law be, that situation becomes a free for all. And uh, I would 
probably say that in the case of Gaza, despite some uh, the atrocities, some atrocities do amount to war crimes. I, if I put on my hat as law professor, I would probably say that there's not the intent on the part of Israeli authorities to destroy the Palestinians. And I would tend to think that, certainly from an international criminal law viewpoint, I don't think at this stage that I have in front of me enough evidence to say that genocide is occurring. I know this would be contentious with some of your listeners, but there certainly are war crimes. When, when, uh, when some some uh, targets uh, make little sense in terms of what they've achieved, and also the presence of uh, of displaced persons. The, what, the, for, but for law farm country, the same thing in Ukraine. We have to look at evidence we have. I would, I would be happy to change my position if I had more information that would lead me. In fact, international criminal law and international criminal court can only work on the basis of evidence. It's like any court of law. And, uh, and there must be a ready to bring from a charge to be taken pre-trial, to be able to be then bring it to trial, there must be evidence of, of that that there is enough to at least bring the situation to trial. So it's not it's not a beyond reasonable doubt, but it must be a preponderance of evidence that yes, the case should proceed. Wow, I've got a lot in that. <laughs> who who sort of decides and what is the threshold for genocide, for example, right? Like when is the point? Is, is it, and what is the evidence? Do we have to see a bunch of atrocities sort of happen in order to pull somebody up on this? Um, where do you sort of draw the line of intent? I think that's really quite interesting. Yes. Now, in terms of ev- of a burden of proof or intent, apart from being that it is beyond reasonable doubt, well, for each for each crime, there are elements that need to be fulfilled. The for the International Criminal Court, there is a publication that elaborates on all the elements of crime. So it's not based pure the evidence, but that it needs to fill in to to fill some categories. For genocide, it is probably one of the most difficult one because there must be an intent to destroy partially or in total a group, and that's a very high threshold. and And that the the, the that makes it quite difficult for an internet for a criminal trial. Now, the case before the court at the International Court of Justice, which is a state versus state case between South Africa and Israel, I think what what South Africa is is pleading is that Article One of the Genocide Convention has been violated. Uh, with insight, I think that the better way for South Africa to have taken the case before the court would not have been under the idea that. Israel has committed genocide, but maybe rather to look at the other obligation of the Genocide Convention, which is that states must not indulge in, in, in or allow genocide to take place. So there's a variety, I mean, there's a variety of subtleties in the process. For me, the best way, and I know I'm probably sounding overly optimistic, is to make sure that through the International Committee of the Red Cross, through NGOs, through uh, hopefully young generations, we can work towards what New Zealand calls a rules-based order, where respect for rules that exist, m- mitigating the number of occasions where these crimes do occur. But at the same time, I think that uh, that we, we have to accept that prosecution under in, in law subjects the situation to a very sometimes formal. Uh, formal uh, re- restrictions and requirements, and that's and if, for instance, there was a case in the before the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, where I think that the what led to the acquittal of an individual, I think on appeal, was that I think the the prosecution's basis was that the weapon used, which was some kind of rocket launcher, was not precise enough, and the commander knew. 
but I think that they misled the court on the um, <clears throat> the precision or the the margin of error of the weapon, and based on that, there was enough. It, 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 the court decided to to acquit the individual. So it's it's it is it's what makes it quite quite uh, uh, frustrating. And I, and I would really say that even though we we like to think we should go to the court, we should bring cases to the international court, international criminal court, but certainly in terms of uh, of uh, reality, is that these cases take a long time, and when you go before a third party to decide like the court you can never be sure what will happen and so sometimes it might be better to try and prosecute within your own borders and in other cases than than, than war crimes or labor you try maybe to at the diplomatic level to sort out differences uh, like for instance even when you look at the the case of these ceasefire resolutions including some of them that have been vetoed probably if the P5 would have met a bit more and would not be in a situation of hostility as they, some of them are at the moment. Maybe we, we could have avoided the circus of having in the same week a resolution <laughs> vetoed and then a resolution with when one of the members, you can see pictures, sits down not doing anything because it, it's simply abstaining. So I, th I think that it is it is uh, the problem with international law. It's it's the the it's, it is really the, the enforcement. And uh, the efforts can be made at implementing it and making sure that the internet domestic law take into account the international law that co courts, uh, governments take into account inter their international the international obligation of their states. But at the same time, it's it's uh, it, it's a victim of the same problems that all domestic legal systems have. If I take, the, I always use a very silly example for my students, but. In New Zealand, the the crimes the crimes the crimes act does say that uh, you cannot commit murder. Yet we do have dozens of murders every year, and in the UK it's the same thing. It doesn't mean that the system is corrupt; that the system is bad. It, it, so there are. I think the the difference with international law is that it can lead to incredible consequences, and I have to say that. In my lifetime, this is the f second time only where I can feel that I, even though they, I, I, I like to think there won't be a, a nuclear war, but it wouldn't take much for, for a leader to decide to press the button, certainly more than it's been in, in, in many, many years.